Hi, welcome to a new video, and it's 35mm camera review time again. Um, and up this week, we have the Canon A1. Um, now, the A1 is a camera that I have a lot of experience with, um, both historically and more recently. Um, <clears throat> it's a camera I owned previously in the early 90s, um, and I picked this one up a few months ago, and I've put a couple of rolls of film through it, but um, back in the 90s, I've, I've got no idea how many rolls of films I ran through an A1. It would have been a hell of a lot of them. Um, and that was back in the time when I was working in photographic retail, so came across a lot of the A-series cameras, um, of which the A1 was the top of the range model at the time. And what I want to do is talk you through the camera itself, what it does, what its kind of features are, and then look at the common pros and cons that surround the camera. Okay, so first of all, the Canon A1, uh, manufactured between 1978 and 1985, they were all made in Japan. Um, this one is from 1979. Uh, you can tell that, by the way, because if you, on any, just about any Canon SLR, in the film canister, holder there. You probably can't see it, but there's some black on black um, <clears throat> markings just in there, which give you the year and month of manufacturer. So this is a T727. Now, the final two digits, nobody knows what that means, but the T gives you the year code, and in this case, a T is 1979. You can find the um, year code conversion charts online I'll link to one I tend to use which is Ken Rockwell's one down below and then the digit that follows it or two digits that follow it are the months so in this case a T7 is 1979 and July um, so yeah there we go that is um, when this one was made so it's a fairly hefty old beast it's in nice condition um, I picked this one up from London Camera Exchange um, with the 50mm f1.8 in good condition and a six month warranty and I think it was around about 150 pounds so a reasonable price for what we'll see is actually quite a feature packed 35mm SLR um, it's compatible with all FD mount lenses um, and most, but not all, of the FL lenses because it doesn't have a mirror lockup on it. Some of the FL lenses which require you to use a mirror lockup won't work with this, but they tend to be some very odd um, extreme fisheye lenses and things of that nature. Um, the Canon A1 was also quite a revolutionary camera. It was the first camera to offer um, what we now find quite commonly on just about any modern camera, in fact every modern camera um, of a, an SLR type and an awful lot of compacts as well, which is what's known as the PASM mode settings. So where you've got program, aperture priority, shutter priority, and full manual on there. Um, it was also the first camera to have a electronically controlled program mode. Now, things can get a bit contentious there because the Minolta XD sort of had a hidden program mode, not as sophisticated electronically as the one found on the A1, um, on the XD, well, it's called the XD in Japan, the XD7 in Europe, and the XD11 in the US. I'm fairly certain that's right. Um, so by most accounts and most people say this was the first one. So it's got the PASM modes, we'll talk more about those as we go through. Uh, it was also a fairly feature packed camera, so just to give you a quick guided tour of it, uh, we've got a little what's called action grip here. 
you sometimes find these missing if you are looking at one try and get one with the action grip because it does make holding the camera a lot nicer the battery compartment sits underneath that and it's a px28 battery also known as a 4lr44 um, there would have been mercury at the time it will accept alkaline ones perfectly happily no issue with that whatsoever um, looking at it from the front we've got pc sync it's got a cover on it there we've got the stop down lever and i want to come on and talk about that more specifically later on and we've got a little lock for the dial that we'll have a look at on the top plate in a moment so Switching over to the top plate for the camera, we've got the ISO range here, which quite frankly, the metering on this and the ISO range it operates across is absurd. I don't know if you can make it out there, but we go from six ASA right the way up to 12,800 ASA, which for a camera of its vintage is ridiculous. It really, really is. Um, you've then got um, exposure compensation and a little button just there locks the exposure compensation dial. So you press that in. I'm at completely the wrong angle to do this easy easily but you press that in and you can move the exposure compensation okay next to that you've got the battery check button here and a little lever that allows you to switch the viewfinder display off if you want but there we go over the other side we've got the what's called a t dial and this has two modes on it so you can actually switch here between tv which is shutter priority turn that around and you've then got aperture priority and both of those are controlled by a dial at the front so you just select what you want because even for aperture priority you have the lens locked in the a for automatic position um, we'll come and talk a little bit more about those a, a little bit later on um, you've got a for active L for lock and then a two and a 10 second a timer on there, which is handy. And just below the wind on lever there, you've got the double exposure button. So you push that in and a red dot shows and you can then wind the camera on without it ex um, moving on a frame, which is extremely handy. Um, looking to this side of the camera, because it is important to look to this side of the camera, what we've got here is the button that is chromed there is a metering button so you can half press the shutter button to activate the metering but you can also press in this little silver ringed button just here and that will also operate the metering and then just above that the black button is an exposure lock button so if you meter press that in and hold it that will then lock the exposure which is quite handy um, particularly if you want to meter and adjust things at the same time uh, only other real thing that we need to be aware of it's hard to see but just on the side here you have a little lever that will black out the viewfinder pulls a little shutter across it which is handy if you're doing long exposures uh, the bottom of the camera has the that's not a battery button uh, battery cover by the way that's the cover for the motor drive contacts for the motor drives and there it is the button for rewinding press that in to rewind your film opening the back of the camera up you just pull the rewind lever open it up and there is the back of the camera fairly straightforward um, it's got a cloth shutter which is arguably one of its weaknesses and we'll talk about that when it comes to pros and cons in a little bit and uh, just get the eye cup in there oh and it's got i always find these quite handy it's got a little um card to put your film box end in there to remind you what film you've got in there so yeah that's a brief rundown of the camera itself so what we'll start doing now is looking at some of the pros and cons behind the canon a1 Okay, so the first of um, the pros behind this are the build quality. It's actually a nicely built 
camera, but I do want to talk about some of the more accurate specifics because there's sometimes some misunderstandings about how this is constructed, but I do want to come on to that. Um, so it is a well-built camera, aside from one issue that we'll talk about when we get on to the cons, um, they have stood the test of time. When they were released, there was a lot of concern about how well would the electrics hold up in them, um, you know, because these were the early days of electronically controlled cameras. So there were concerns about how they'd hold up. And the truth of the matter is they've actually held up extremely well. Now, what I wanted to talk about about the build is a lot of people mistakenly assume that these are an all metal construction. So a metal chassis with metal body components added on. That's not actually true, and it's not actually true for any of the A series of cameras that Canon bought out. It is true that they do have a metal chassis, aluminium in the case of the A series, but the top plate, the bottom plate, and most of the body panels around it are in fact ABS plastic. Now what fools a lot of people, and let me see if I can get, because this one's actually in really nice condition, you can see what looks like brassing just there, which if you don't know what brassing is, it's basically where the paint finish of a metal bodied camera rubs off and you can see the brass underneath. So a lot of people see brassing on these and assume they're metal. They're not. Um, basically what Canon did was they took ABS panels, they plated them with brass in the case of black bodied ones or chrome in the case of silver and black bodied ones and then for the black bodied ones over the brass finish they basically then electroplated them with the black finish. This gives the feel of metal so it does feel like it's a metal bodied camera it's cold to the touch um, in a lot of cases and when they started wearing on the corners and things like that it looked as though there were metal underneath because of the brass but if you get one that's worn enough you'll actually be able to see below that brass there is plastic now that's not to say that a plastic bodied camera is a problem. Let me just point out, I have a Canon T90 up here. This was a camera that is almost entirely, apart from the chassis, ABS constructed, and these things were nicknamed the tank. So ABS is, is actually, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. In fact, it has some advantages. If you've got a metal body camera and something hits the metal, well, the metal will dent, but more importantly, the force transfers through the metal. There is very little give or flex in the metal to absorb any of that impact. ABS does that, it absorbs impacts. So it will flex, absorbing some of the impact and stopping the damage getting through to the interior of the camera. So ABS is not actually a a major issue when it comes to construction. It's once again down to how well constructed is it? How well has that ABS been used? And in my opinion, the aluminium chassis and the ABS construction of the A-series cameras, particularly the A1, it's not an issue. These are well-built cameras, they are robust, and they've stood the test of time. So for me, it's a definite con of the A1. So on to the second con, and that is, despite the huge number of buttons that uh, and dials that cover it, this is actually a really easy camera to use. Um, it's got a wonderfully bright and clear viewfinder. You don't have a lot of clutter in the viewfinder. You've basically just got shutter speed and aperture read out, and they're in red LEDs, although as I said, you can turn them off if you wish. That can be useful under some circumstances. <coughs> Apologies. Um, you've also got, as I say, full program, so you can whack it basically in P mode just there. Make sure the lens is on A, point, shoot. Obviously you have to focus, but in this mode, it will set everything for you. And it is actually a biased um, exposure curve for programs, so it's not just a straight li linear one. 
and it does a good job out of the box. But you've then also got the ability to just either by taking it off of the P mode there and selecting a shutter speed, well, we're now in shutter priority, or by rotating that AT dial over to the AV side of things, you can then select the aperture you want, and with the aperture you want selected, fire away, and it will select the shutter speed for you. It is possible to shoot it in full manual, but that unfortunately does become a little bit of a con, and I want to talk about that separately. But the ease of use in the program and the priority modes make this a really flexible and really easy camera to use. It's also, I find, extremely ergonomic. The exposure comp uh, sorry, the exposure lock and the metering button on the left-hand side fall nice and easily to the thumb, and it's easy to select either one of them. So I say the wonderfully bright viewfinder on there, um, the lovely shutter mechanism on there. It's just a very nice, very easy camera to use that I've always found actually extremely nice. I also think it looks incredibly good. I've always been a big fan of how the A1 looks. Um, I like black cameras generally more than black and chrome ones. It's a marginal thing, but I do, and I just like the way the A1 looked. It was, by the way, only available in pure black like this, unlike most of the other um, A range which were available more commonly in silver and black, and occasionally black for some of them. On to our third pro behind the A1, um, and you'll recognise this one if you've watched my review of the Canon FTB, which I will link to just up there, so you can go and watch that if you want to. Another great Canon camera. Um, so the range of lenses you can get for this in terms of the FD mount. I mean, yes, it'll take most of the FL lenses, but they're relatively uncommon. There's a lot less of them on the market than FD glass, and they tend to be more expensive. They don't have as good a coating as the FD range. Just stick with the FD stuff. There's loads of it about, and almost all of it even some of the kit-based stuff is really, really good. I mean, at the end of the day, glass is what makes a 35mm camera to a very large degree. Um, and you know, all of the images that you see here were shot with this camera with one of a combination of lenses, but I think actually it was the 50mm, and one moment... No, I tell a lie. I, di I didn't use the 70 to 150 with these two rolls of films at all. I was misremembering that. I was thinking of when I was shooting the FTB. This was almost exclusively this, the 50mm on there. So uh, I think it's a perfectly good lens. I think the FD glass range is extremely good. And the nice thing is, because when Canon went autofocus, they brought out a brand new lens mount range for it with the EF, it's not like the Nikon glass that could carry over onto the autofocus bodies and still be used, admittedly limited, in a limited manner. You couldn't do that with the uh, FD stuff, so there's still a lot of it out there, very, very reasonably priced, and some absolutely superb lenses around for it as well. So that, the FD lens range that's available, is a definite pro for me. Okay, on to my final pro, and this one is going to be quite, or potentially, contentious. You see, the thing I've always found odd since getting back into 35mm photography, um, after a, a long time away from it, is this, a little bit like the FTB I was talking about earlier, it seems to not be particularly popular, and I really don't understand why, um, because you can see adverts for the Canon AE-1 and the AE-1 program, um, 
and, and they sell like hotcakes. They genuinely do. You can see that. People banging on about how the AE-1 and the AE-1 program are the best cameras Canon ever made. They're not. Um, and how, you know, they're, they're the best of that series and they're the best beginners cameras, etc., etc., etc. I disagree with that. You see, you can pick up an A1 for similar money to an AE-1 or an AE-1 program. Very similar money. They, they all stretch roughly across the same price range. This is a better camera, objectively a better camera, than either the AE-1 or the AE-1 program. And that's for a number of reasons. One, I think it looks better. It's got a better metering range on it. It's got more features on it. But more importantly, <coughs> what the AE-1 and the AE-1 program both lack is aperture priority. They're both shutter priority. They've got manual shutter priority. And in the case of the AE-1 program, they have a program mode on there. Well, this has all of those. And the cons I'm going to talk about around some of those things in a few minutes apply to all of those models as well. But this also has aperture priority. And certainly for me, aperture priority is far more useful than shutter priority in a broader range of situations. Being perfectly honest, if you're shooting a lot of sport or action photography, then yes, shutter priority has its place and its advantages. But being honest, the Canon A range of cameras, that's not what you're going to use for that. That should not be your go-to body for that. So I would contest that aperture priority is a more useful semi-automatic mode than shutter priority. But even if you don't agree, this has still got shutter priority. It's got shutter priority, it's got aperture priority, it's got a full program mode, and it's got full manu uh, manual. So it does more than either the AE-1 or the AE-1 program does. It does more full stop than either of them do. Um, it, it doesn't lose anything from those bodies, it only gains features from the, uh, over them, and it's a similar price. I I genuinely don't understand why people would buy an AE-1 or an AE-1 program over an A1. Your mileage may well vary, but I, I don't get it. And certainly, when I, back when I worked in photographic retail in the early 90s, keep in mind these weren't new cameras by then, any of them, um, nobody would pick an AE-1 or an AE-1 program over an A1, and we could charge significantly more for AE-1s back then second hand than we could for either of those cameras. The market supported that, but doesn't seem to be the case now. I don't understand why, so if you can pick one of these up for the same price as an AE-1 or an AE-1 program, go for it. Okay, right, got to talk about the cons. It's not a perfect camera by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, it has some really quite annoying things about it that I want to talk about. Now, the first one is there is a known issue with these, and that is that the mechanism inside it, particularly the diaphragm um, mechanism, can um, basically become delubricated. The lubrication dries out on it, it can get a bit gunked up, and it develops what's called the Canon cough. Now, the Canon cough is a very marked sound and out. If yours sounds like that, you're absolutely fine. There is no cough there, that is just a really nice shutter release. If when you press it down, it makes a kind of really weird wheezing noise as the shutter fires, <laughs> type noise, then that's the mechanism has become gunked up. The good thing is these are fairly easy to work on. Um, there's plenty of DIY tutorials around that basically shows you how you can actually lubricate them through one of the um, mounting screws in there, or, if you send it into a camera repair place, these will not be expensive to get either re-lubricated or a strip down, a clean out and a re-lube at that point. Or you can buy one with a warranty on it, which will allow you to get that covered under warranty if it does develop. So although the Canon Cough is something to be aware of when you're buying, and this applies to absolutely any of the A-series cameras, not just the A1, 
but any of the A series cameras. These, it's fairly easy to fix, okay? I mean, try and buy one without it, but if you do have one with it, it's not the end of the world. It can be fixed quite reasonably. Just make sure the price you pay reflects that you may have to get some work done on it. Same as anything. Okay, now to move on to what for me is arguably the biggest frustration of the A1. Um, and that is using it in manual mode is quite frankly a di diabolical pain in the backside. It really is. It was quite clear when Canon came out with this camera that they wanted people to focus on the automatic modes, either the full program or the shutter or the aperture priority mode on it um, and the main reason why I say this is to use it in manual well at first it doesn't seem that bad you just make sure that the AT dial is set to shutter speed you then take the lens off of A and you select the aperture you want here and the shutter speed you want here so far so good yes the problem is that when you look through the viewfinder, what the information inside is telling you is basically as though it was in shutter priority. So if we have a look here, I've got the shutter speed set to 1 one twenty-fifth, so 1 over 125th, and f5.6 on the lens. But if I look, point this outside a meter, it's telling me it should be f4.5 which means I'd have to change it. Now, that's because the metering inside of what you see through the viewfinder is basically what it deems to be the correct aperture for the shutter speed you've selected. You then have to take the camera away from your eye and check and adjust the aperture before putting it back up to shoot. It's not a neat system by any stretch of the imagination. It works, but it's not a neat system. Now combine that with the fact that if the camera is in one of the automatic modes and you go to push in the stop down button, it won't push in. You've got to be in manual to be able to push in the stop down metering button. Now it does actually lock in place. It will lock the stop down metering in place if you just flick this little lever up or you can just push it in as it stands. But it means you can't get a depth of field preview unless you're in manual mode. Now that's a real pain in the backside. It, it genuinely is. There's no way around that. But there's also, and this is actually mentioned in the manual, um, so it was kind of quite clearly a fault that they couldn't fix in time for launch and had to find a workaround. But what I've just done, I've put the camera in manual mode, I've hit the stop down button, okay, I've not taken a shot, but I then put it back into an automatic mode. If I now meter, I get a load of flashing ease in the viewfinder and the camera will not fire. Effectively, it locks the camera up. It does cover this in the manual, but a lot of people buying these secondhand are not gonna have the manual and will think that they've broken it. You haven't, but it's not obvious how you fix it. Okay, so to fix it, this, as I say, completely locked up at the moment. What you have to do is go to the double exposure lever push that in so the red dot's showing, wind the camera on, and now it's cleared and it will fire. It's odd, <laughs> it is about the politest phrase I can use for it, but it is definitely a con. The camera is not as easy to use in manual mode as it should be, being perfectly honest, and it does have this really bizarre, set of circumstances that they're unusual but they're not that unusual where you can lock the camera up and think that you've broken it so that's why i wanted to cover the work around for that now for me although it is a a con because it slows down the use of the camera in manual mode i must confess when i use um an a1 i tend to use it in aperture priority and then use exposure compensation or lock and 
reframe on the metering and I find that works extremely well. So it, it is a con, but it depends how you shoot, being perfectly honest. Okay, on to the final con of the A1. And this was something that was rightly pointed out as being a bit of a limitation when the camera was actually released. So keep in mind the A1 sat at the top of the A series food chain. Um, it was their highest level prosumer camera um, and sat directly below the F1 in that kind of hierarchy. But the shutterbox mechanism is effectively exactly the same as the rest of the A1, uh, oh, sorry, not A1, the rest of the A series. So it does mean that we've got what is actually a fairly old school rubberized cloth shutter. It's, it is a vertical travel sorry, a horizontal travel shutter, which does limit what it is able to do. And that's reflected in the top shutter speed, which is only one thousandth of a second. Uh, more common for cameras in this kind of price bracket when it was released was already one two thousandth of a second. That was kind of the norm. So it had a reduced top shutter speed in comparison to some of its peers and also its flash sync speed of 1 60th of a second was again considered a bit of a limitation for a camera of its type. Now for me, because I was predominantly using these to shoot gigs and things like that, that wasn't ever really an issue. Um, your chances when you're shooting wide open apertures in a gig in very low light, you're not getting anywhere near one thousandth of a second. And I wasn't predominantly using flash at this point, much as I still don't. So neither of those things were a limitation for me, either back then or now, but they most definitely can be considered a limitation of the camera in comparison to some of its peers. So it is something that you do need to think about. So that's the cons for the Canon A1. Okay, so in summary, um, the Canon A1. Now, despite the cons that I've gone through, um, I still think this is an absolutely great camera. And if you are looking for a first 35 mil camera, I actually think that if you want something that is fairly easy to use and pick up and use, then this is a great buy, particularly if you're looking to get into, as I say, that wide range of cheap and fairly easily available FD glass. Um, I definitely think it is a better buy over the AE-1 or the AE-1 program, or pretty much the rest of the A-series cameras. Yes, it is towards the top of the price range that you're going to pay for those on the market these days, but it's not much more expensive, and in fact, in a lot of cases, a similar sort of price to the AE-1 and the AE-1 program, and it's a better camera than either of those. So if you're looking for something that's got a lot of ease of use features, <clears throat> particularly, as I say, in the metering modes, then it's definitely one to go for. If you want um, a purely mechanical FD mount camera, then the FTB is still the one to go for. So. This. Get this. Watch my video and get this if you want something that is purely mechanical, but keep in mind it's manual only. There's no aperture priority, no shutter priority, and certainly, certainly no program mode to be found on that. If those are what you want and you're looking at the FD range, go for this. It is an absolutely great camera. It will serve you well. It will grow with you. <clears throat> As I say, the only thing that becomes a limitation is the manual mode on it. And there's nothing to say over time, if you're getting into 35mm shooting and you invest in the FD lens, to be perfectly honest, a pairing of these two together, this one for your manual old school mechanical days and this one for your, I just want to pick it up and shoot with it, absolutely brilliant pairing in my in my opinion which is why I've got
both of these. So that is the Canon A1. If you've enjoyed this video, please do give it a like. If you've ever owned one of these or you've got any thoughts on this, pop it in the comments down below. I'd love to hear from you on it. And if you uh, want to see more content like this, please do subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified when new videos get uploaded. Thanks very much for watching, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.